It is five o'clock Pacific time on Friday, so you know what time it is. Alrighty, so we're going to be doing a little bit of blind tasting between the Andronic Peated and the Ben Rick 10 year old Peated. Uh, but before I get into that, excuse me, <coughs> allergies. Things are blooming right now. We're not covered in snow like Texas and a lot of the rest of the country. We can actually enjoy California weather. It's actually quite nice. Um, still a little cool. Got a you know, hoodie on, but allergies are starting to kick in already. Uh, anyway. So enough of that. I'm um, say hello to every, some of the usuals are in the house. Um, Jack White is in the house. Thank you very much for tuning in. Donner Pass Whiskey. Mike Bennett, how you doing, sir? Ron Gurgley, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, Michael C, 2019. And Doug Petty, thank you for tuning in. Silverlock Whiskey Club. And, all right, let's get rolling. So a while back, I did a whole series of live streams on blind tasting. Uh, if you ever want to go back and check those out, uh, the thumbnail for that looks kind of like, oh, I thought I uploaded it. Oh, there it is. It'll look like this. So I can't remember. It might be five or six weeks or whatever it is I did on blind tasting. However, on talking about, in theory, blind tasting, I didn't actually get into the practice. I actually do a blind tasting. So I'm going to do a little bit of blind tasting uh, tonight, only two whiskeys. Uh, da, 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 dum. So the glasses are actually a gift. A little while back, I did a head-to-head -head live between, I think it was the Ardbeg 10 and the Electric 10. And problems going head-to-head -head with those two is visually, you could tell them apart. You didn't even need to, you know, smell them or taste them. Just visually, they look very, very different. So I just happened to mention, mention that I wish I had... Some, you know, uh, Black Glen Cairn um, blind tasting glasses. And a local, someone who lives near me and who was watching, but, and bought me a couple glasses and met up with me. And I didn't even know why he'd want to meet up or anything like that. But he gave me a box. And I was like, okay, what's this? And so here we go. I have two Glen Cairns, completely black. The challenge of these uh, is, one, how do you know it's really, really clean? Because with the clear ones, you can see you've got spots or whatever on them. So just kind of clean them the best you can. The second is, is how can you tell how much you've poured in there? So if you have a set of these, and I plan, I want to get some more of these um, so I can do like a longer flight, you know. Um, so what you could do is first pour your whiskey in a re regular Glen Cairn. So you got your measurements right, how much you want in there. And then pour from regular Glen Cairn into uh, the black Glen Cairns. Um, a uh, Paul Mensik. I'm, I don't know if I'm pronouncing Mensik. Sorry if I butcher your last name. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, Judith Stoll. Thank you for tuning in. No Man's Van. Thank you very much for uh, tuning in. Now, these two whiskeys, however, um, if I didn't have uh, the Black Land Karens, uh, th these two are actually very, very similar in terms of color. So I turn them sideways and put them up to the, and you look at that one, visually, it's hard to tell on this, with the camera and so forth, it's hard to tell. But actually sitting down like that, you could probably tell the best. So these are actually visually very, very, very close. So in this case, if I didn't have the black Glen Cairns, I could get by with regular Glen Cairns. Now I poured these about a half an hour ago. Of course, you can see both bottles, I'm about halfway through on both of them. I've already reviewed these. If you haven't seen the reviews on, on these, yeah, you want to check them out. I poured these about a half an hour ago. They should be about right here. I then put two. Uh, I didn't did this. So I did this. You know, close your eyes. I don't want to knock anything over. Do this. I'm trying to trying to do this blind without paying attention. I'm not looking. And that pen and keep moving around, moving around, and moving around. Try to confuse yourself. Moving around, 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 and around, around, around. Okay. So I'd already did that about a half an hour ago. Now I just did it again. There's no end. I, I do not. I do not know what is in these glasses. And I use the coins I'm using. These are uh, Scotch test dummies. Are identical. 
So I can't tell by just looking at the at the coins. But before I get into this, I want to talk a little bit about blind tasting, in case you didn't see the previous uh, live streams. Romesh De Silva, thank you much for uh, tuning in from Huntington Beach, uh, further south here in, in California, uh, down there sort of close to Los Angeles. Uh, Derek Beckman, thank you much for uh, tuning in. So I do want to talk a little bit about blind tasting. Um, this is something which I wish some of my fellow whiskey tubers, I wish they would, this is my opinion, they can get offended all they want. Um, put a little more thought into how they do blind, if they're going to do something blind, blind tasting. Um, there are ways you want to blind taste and there, and there are ways you don't want to blind taste. So I'm going to show you a little side by side. So there's two different types of blind tasting. One is test the whiskey and the other is test the taster. So when you're testing the whiskey, the goal is obviously to evaluate the quality of the whiskey. The whiskey should be made uh, within a known category, bourbon, sumo, scotch, Irish pot still, Japanese, misenary cast, Canadian rye, or whatever. Third, if possible, the whiskey should be evaluated on more than one occasion at different times and settings, such as a neck pour, neat with water, and so forth. This is probably one of the things I wish some of my fellow whiskey tubers who tend to do a wham, bam, thank you for the dram, neck pour review, and not spend any time on it. Or the other thing is you have to do is when you're watching these guys, and they're, we're all friends, is take their perception and evaluation of a whiskey for what it is. It's just a neck pour, sort of an off-the-cuff review, right? Um, and I'm not the only one because some of the guys that do that, when I read the comments on their videos, other people are making the same content, uh, comments, which is, hey, you need to spend some more time on it. You need to try different contexts and settings. And I've already talked about this before in different videos. I tend to do a neck pour. I tend to try it neat. I tend to try a little bit of water at different times. So it takes me minimally like three or four days, a minimally to get through a whiskey to where I'm at a point to where I feel, okay, I think I got a pretty good grasp on this whiskey. You know, it'd be better if you finish the bottle. Roy Aquavite, he finishes the whole bottle. Uh, Jason, Mash and Drum, a lot of times, he, he's, uh, he, a lot of times he's also kind of near the bottom of the bottle. But I get to a point, at least I am comfortable and I'm sure as to what I think. I have my, my notes and then I um, will compare notes with other whiskey tubers. The fourth step here in testing the whiskey is evaluate the whiskey based on its quality of craftsmanship, layers of complexity, development, structure, follow through, and so forth, not the taster's personal preferences. <coughs> Excuse me. So I have a higher preference for scotch over bourbon. I have a higher preference for bourbon over Japanese whiskey. I have a higher preference for Japanese whiskey, bourbon, scotch, Irish, over Canadian, although I need to spend more time with Canadian whiskeys. However, you can recognize the quality of something, even if that's not your preferred style. Music, for example, there are plenty of styles of mu music or artists that while they may not, that may not be my type of music, I can say they're a good piano player, they have good vocals, uh, they're crap, really good at writing a song, so I can recognize the quality of them as an artist, even if their style of music is not my personal preference. And that's where you can actually be. And a lot of people say, you know, um, oh, it's all subjective. You know, there's no, no objectivity. I disagree. I highly, highly disagree. If you can separate your personal preferences and evaluate something based on its structure, based on its quality, its development, if it's something is well made. So in, let me take this off here just for a second, talk a little bit about this. So when you're studying for the Quartermaster Small AAs, you're studying for the Winesburg Educational Trust, you're studying for um, the, uh, the Institute of Masters of Wine, you are required to not just say, I think this whiskey, or excuse me, I think this wine is this, I think it's these grapes from this region, made in this style, so on and so forth, this vintage and all that. You have to give a quality assessment. You have to be able to justify your quality assessment. And you will be counted lower if, the, if you're giving a budget mass production quality wine. You know, it's coming out of Central Valley. 
you know, versus a higher end uh, wine. There are some videos out there that are total BS. There's this guy, he's, I don't, I don't know if he's still on YouTube or not. Um, Adam ruins everything. And I think they had him on the History Channel or Comedy Channel for a while. And he did this thing on wine tasting stuff. Um, uh, Mike Bennett says, epistemology food fight, right? Um, and he did this whole thing. The guy doesn't know anything jack shit about wine. He doesn't know jack shit about evaluating wine. And so with his lack of expertise, he makes this, makes this video or TV show. The problem with a lot of wine evaluations, and they give medals and all that kind of crap, is they're done at uh, events, right? Uh, a wine and, wine and food and art fair, right? So you have a panel of judges, and they're going in one day through like 40 different Zinvendels. Uh, yeah, it's no wonder, it's no wonder that some some mediocre wines can get gold medals, right? It's not it's not a good context for really judging a wine, and a lot of times that's what happens. Now there, there's more to it than that. I'm just giving you sort of one one example. So the first type of um, wine or whiskey evaluation is evaluating the whiskey. So there's been times in which I've given a whiskey that's not my personal preference, not my personal style. Um, and yet I recognize the evolution, the development, the depth of flavor. I could tell it was a well-crafted whiskey. All right, let's go back to this other kind. Da -da -da -da. Bring the uh, slide back up. All right. Test the taster. This is also something which I wish, you know, Chris, most of my fellow whiskey tubers aren't doing it to be formal. They're just doing it for fun. You know, they're not taking it that serious. And so... You know, in terms of what they're doing, you know, shouldn't take it that serious. So don't be, it shouldn't be overly critical of what they're doing because they're just doing it for fun. They're not doing it for an exam. They're not doing it for certification, right? They're not doing anything like that. So, but the goal is to test the knowledge and skills of the taster. Uh, the whiskey should be a classic category from a classic region that is widely available. If there's one thing that a lot of whiskey tubers do is, they pull some obscure whiskey from some uh, obscure regions, or some strange bottling to whatever else, and then try to see if somebody can identify it or whatever. Um, no. It, now, this is a little bit more challenging, I think, with whiskey than it is with wine. So for wine, for example, a classic category, let's say it would be Pinot Noir. And you have your classic regions, Burgundy, California, say the Russian River, um, um Oregon, say the Willamette Valley, um, New Zealand. These are regions that are known for making Pinot Noir. You wouldn't want to do a Pinot Noir from Idaho or Texas, right? Nothing against those states, and maybe people like wines from those states, but those aren't classic reasons for Pinot Noir. We could I'll say the same from Cabernet Sauvignon and so on and so forth. So it should be a, a classic region and one that is widely available which means it has to do with a distribution issue. You can't expect somebody to be able to identify a whiskey that, you know, it's only sold locally in Texas or only sold locally in California and isn't have wide distribution. They, there's no way in the world, some, you know, some distillery, it only makes, you know, a thousand cases a year. You know, they're not going to expect to recognize it. So a classic region and, and what's widely available, a Highland single malt scotch, right? Uh, Kentucky bourbon, a Canadian rye, and so forth. So not an obscure whiskey from a non-established region, such as a single malt from Denmark. I'm not, Denmark probably makes some very fine uh, single malts, or a bourbon from Idaho, and so forth. Uh, the third, the level of difficulty should match the level of expected expertise. The higher level expected expertise, the more difficult the test. So in the court of mash sommeliers, let me take this off for a second. Um, da -da -da -da. So, in a, of course, I'm talking more official, you know, we're talking about certifications, awards, degrees, that kind of a thing. You have your introductory, you have a certified, you have an advanced, and then you have a master's. The amount of wines that can appear at the certified level, introductory actually don't get tasted on blind tasted. At the, the level, the number of wines and regions that can appear on a certified level 
isn't as much as an advanced level or a master's level. For a master's level for wines, the whole world is open. The whole world is open. Uh, just about everything. Um, so you would want to do the same thing with whiskey. Uh, classic regions, classic bottlings, classic profiles uh, um, that the taster should be expected to know. And I'm probably going to be, for, for whiskey, all the next couple of years, be going through some official um, tastings. Hey, uh, Whiskey Mystery, thank you much for uh, tuning in. How you doing, neighbor? They live near San Francisco. So uh, let's go to the next step. So now nobody in the whiskey tuber world that I know of is doing anything for any sort of certi certificates, some awards or, class or, or classifications or degrees or anything like that. All right, I, I don't, I'll be going for that kind of stuff. I don't, but I don't know anybody who's, who's doing that sort of a thing. So let's take a classic Kentucky bourbon, right? Maker's Mark. That's something that would be could very very easily be on say at a certain if if there was such a thing as a lower level of um, a whiskey certification for blind tasting a bourbon from Texas you know because the distribution in this wine a little more challenging to get that would be at probably at at a higher level so a uh, Sauvignon Blanc uh, from for a, at a lower level in wines, uh, you're looking at uh, the something in the Loire Valley, um, perhaps California, perhaps New, and New Zealand. Um, you're not going to get a Sauvignon Blanc from Texas or Arizona, although I'm sure they they grow some down there. May or may not get one from California, but there's some classic profiles that are typical of these regions and those wines. Again. When we're talking about classic regions, classic styles, it's what's typical, not something that's odd or strange. You, you know, Sauvignon Blanc tends to be done in stainless steel. They don't put it in new oak. So to give someone a Sauvignon Blanc that's but aged in new oak, it would completely throw the wine off. Same thing you, you deal with whiskey. Something that's typical, something that's classic, something that's expected, something that is in the industry and on the market, the consumer is actually, for the average consumer, this is what they're drinking, right? Because that's the idea. The, the goal is not, when you're testing a taster, is not just to show off some skills, although that goes on as well, right? You, you get some pride and you get these, you get a thrill of excitement of passing exam, right? Um, but it's really, if you're gonna be working in the industry so that you have a level of, of expertise, that you have a deeper knowledge of wine or whiskey, so that when you're dealing with a consumer, whether at a bar or uh, at a store or something, or you're teaching, that kind of a context, you have more knowledge so you can convey and describe and interact with a consumer. That's really what it's, what it's all about. Yes, egos get involved and people like to show off and with the certifications or people like to, eh, hey, I got it, yeah, you know, you win the prize, whatever. Sure, plenty of that goes on, but it's really supposed to be about Equipping yourself to be a more knowledgeable person who can articulate the profile of a whiskey to the consumer so that they can make a choice as to what they want to buy. That is really what it's supposed to be about. Supposed to be about. Um, you know, there's sort of this increase in right of the whiskey sommelier thing, and I don't want to get off on that too much, but there is problems in the wine sommeliers. I used to run the study group for the quarter master sommeliers. Six seven thousand people. I've left it. I've left the guild of sommeliers. Um, there, there's been a lot of drama and a lot of um, what would you call it um, um, scandals over the last couple of years. I've gotten tired of it, and I said I'm done with these people for at least for now. For the most part, I'm stick focusing on whiskey. But there's been just a lot of bullshit going on with them. And but I had noticed for a long time that there are a lot of people, particularly as they went up in the quarters of Master Malays, the egos just climbed and climbed. And I met some real a holes, met some fantastic people. I mean, I know some fat, fantastic people who are masters of wine or advanced or master sommeliers or awesome people, real servants, right? Willing to help and teach other people. And then there's the people with the, the a holes with the egos. Luna Aaron, so would you say that testing the taster is more common uh, in wine than in whiskey? Um, so it, everything in the wine industry in terms of 
tasting and certifications is far more advanced in the wine world than is the whiskey world. I mean, by decades, right? By decades. Uh, and it's just, the, the, it's it's more global, it's bigger. It, everything about wine in the wine world is bigger uh, than, than, the, than the whiskey world. You can get, you really get your head around the whiskey world within a couple of years. Um, it, it's just that much smaller, right? I mean, there's 400 wineries in Napa Valley. How many distilleries are in Scotland? 130, right? Um, <laughs> so there's more wineries in Napa Valley, which only produces about 4% of the wines in California, 4%. And yet it's bigger than all of Scotland in terms of um, the number of producers, just to kind of put things in, in perspective. All right, all right, let's, let's get, get back onto, right, bring that slide back up. So uh, the test, the taster should be scored on correct description, not merely identifying the whiskey correctly. So it's not just a matter of guessing it right, but that your description and your descriptions are are, are 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 accurate. Identify the base ingredient. So if what I'm getting blinded on is it a malted barley? Is it corn? Is it rye? Is it say a high rye bourbon? Right. Identify the region. Is this from the Scottish Highlands, Ireland, Kentucky, and so forth? Now, I think with whiskeys, in terms of the region, that can be a lot more challenging. But that's why it's really important to have classic profiles, classic styles, classic bottlings that are representative of the regions. Identify the style, malt, bourbon, rye, pot still, a blend. Identify production method and casking. Um, so if you think it's a pot still, if you think it's... Um, um, a column still casking. Do you think it's new oak? Do you think it's got some um, neutral oak? Do you think it's? Do you think it may perhaps some used oak? Uh, and then identify aromas and flavors established by a panel of experts. Now this gets back to objective versus subjective. Um, let me take this off again. Da -da -da. This is another pet peeve of mine. This is a this is another pet peeve of mine because I people, oh, tasting is all subjective and whatever you say, whatever you get is whatever you get. I hear people say it all the time. I highly disagree. I highly disagree, and I can prove it. And I can prove it. And I did this. I've done this before. All I have to do is someone who doesn't have the whiskey in front of them. All I have to do is start describing classic profiles of type, types of whiskeys and someone who knows their whiskeys will be able to tell me what it is. So I'm, I'm going to describe, I'm just, I'll, I'll throw a couple simple examples up in front of you. Um, I'm getting caramel corn. Okay. You guys tell me what am I describing? What am I describing? Okay. You guys tell me what I'm describing. I'm going to describe for you and you guys tell me what it is. Caramel corn. High intensity vanilla, perhaps a little butterscotch, cinnamon, nutmeg, new oak, a hint of um, licorice, full bodied, semi sweet. Okay, so Jack White says bourbon, Mike Bennett says bourbon, Luna Aaron, how would you say an amateur would educate herself? with these ideas you mentioned. Practice, 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 practice. If you can be part of a team with other people, Whiskey Mystery says breakfast. <laughs> uh, bourbon, higher ABS. All right. um, and it, well, Nick Keen just got specific with the Jack da Daniels. Okay, so you basically got it right. The other option, right? So you, you've narrowed it down. You've eliminated Scotch. You've eliminated Irish. You've eliminated Japanese. You've eliminated Canadian. You got it down. There's another option. It could have been potentially a bourbon. To really, it could have been a bourbon or what else? I mentioned a black licorice note. So what could it also be? That would be very very close. Now I'm now I'm not talking about particular bottles, right? You're never expected to identify the company, the brand. Just the categories. So I'm smart says a rye, a high rye bourbon. Beth Higgins says high rye bourbon, right? But you know 
because if you know high rye bourbons are, you know, 51% corn, 49% rye is a bourbon. 51% rye, 49% corn, <laughs> right? Well, that 1% can make a difference in terms of category. So in a blind tasting, if all your descriptors, if all the descriptors I just gave you, I, I'm writing these down. I just write all these. And my conclusion was it was a bourbon when actually it was a rye with a high corn content, you wouldn't fail. You wouldn't necessarily fail, right? Because they're that close. However, if I gave all those descriptors and then said, oh, I think it's a, a, a Canadian rye or I, I think it's a, you know, a scotch or you know, a you know, Highland scotch, then you're off. But in a taste test, in taste test, if I said, oh, this is a bourbon, but my notes, I said, um, dried black fruits, cherry, caramel, vanilla, butterscotch, um, a hint of earth. Um, you know, that's not a description of a bourbon or even a high rye bourbon or even a rye. Some of those notes are off, right? The fact that I can give you these descriptors and you can tell me what it is, not in terms of a specific bottling. You never, ever, ever, it's, oh, uh, you know, that's a uh, uh, Chateau Latour, a 98. No, it's the region. It's the grapes, right? And 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 wine, vin you want to get within a certain ballpark for vintages. Same thing with whiskeys. You wouldn't be expected to identify the producer or, you know, but you might want to, uh, age statements, but the problem with scotch with age statements is the age is the lowest amount, not that there could be more and stuff like that. All righty, so you get the general idea, right? This is basically what you're supposed to be doing for uh, for a uh, blind tasting. If it if there wasn't some objectivity, if there wasn't some objectivity to this, your response would be, I don't know, man. That's what you get. I don't get that on anything. I, I don't. I don't know. I don't get that. I don't, I don't know what you're talking. Could be anything. That would be your response to my descriptors, right? If it was completely subjective. But because there are classic profiles to whiskeys and wines and beers and everything else, right? That's the reason why you can get that, right? All right. Uh, but the blind tasting would also need contrast. No, you're just getting blind tasted on whatever it is you're getting blind tasted. All right, let me go back to my uh, picture there real quick. Sorry. Get back up. All right. Um, so you'd want to be able to identify the ABV within a certain percentage, right? So let's say it's 46. I, this would have to be determined by a panel, not me. You should probably, I would say you probably should be within 3%. So if at 46, you know, you could go 49, 40, 43 to 49. You shouldn't think it was a 40 and you shouldn't think it was, you know, a 55. You should be within a certain percentage. And then a quality assessment. That's prop the quality assessment one is probably uh, perhaps more subject subjective. Now, I'm not saying that blind tasting or buying wh whiskeys is 100% objective. I'm not saying that at all. I'm not saying that at all. Robert Parker, who basically established the 100 point score uh, for evaluating wines, is one of the first outside the industry, outside the wine industry uh, persons to become a wine critic. He had previously been an attorney. He's the one that came up with the 100-point scoring system, which then he started a, a, a magazine called uh, The Wine Advocate. Then the Whiskey Advocate borrowed, because he was an att attorney and is the same thing as an advocate, that's where he kind of used his past of being an attorney to name the magazine. And then the Whiskey Advocate just ripped him off and used the term advocate because of association of the standard he made in the wine world. Anyway, he came up with a 100-point score, and that's what, that's what I've been using ever, ever since. All right. But he himself, Robert Parker, um, he's retired now. Uh, he even says, yes, there is a certain subjective, subjective uh, level to it. And that's why repeated tastings, in terms of doing a quality assessment, I don't like the wham, bam, thank you, ma'am approach to evaluating a whiskey. I think you should taste it a number of different times in a number of different ways. Notice both these bottles where they're at. 
I've got them. I've, I've got them pretty much, you know, uh, uh, maybe a third, to, getting close to a half, way down. All right. So what time we got? All right. So we got about the halfway mark. All right. I, and to really and trying in a number of different ways, right? Because there are a lot of things that can affect your. If you have a cold, if you have allergies, what you've been eating, your mood, and everything else can affect your perception of a whiskey. There are times I'm more in the mood for a bourbon. There are times I'm more in the mood for a peated whiskey, you know, and the seasons, everything else. So you just have to be aware of your own perceptions uh, and preferences. If you've been really, really, really busy, tasting, 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 all right, Uh, you know, you kind of get burnout. When I, I go to the uh, Institute of Master Wine Bordeaux tasting in San Francisco, they probably won't be having it next year, I'm guessing. They taste four years after the vintage. There's like 60 different producers, right, from Bordeaux. Uh, I focus on 10 regions or 10 producers out of those, and I follow those every year just to see what their, their vintage. And, I, and there are different parts of areas, AOCs, within Bordeaux, I, I've chosen them as representatives of the areas of Bordeaux and I track them year to year to year. So every year I'm tasting the same 10 producers to get a sense of the vintage and to get a sense of them. All right. So that's what I do. And I've been doing this for years. Um, so one of them, Saint Emilion, you know, one of them, Saint Julian, Margot, all these sub regions within, uh, within Bordeaux. The Grave, the Pesach Leonian, you know all that, right? So I, I I follow the same producers year after year, year, and that's how I track these 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 wines. Um, because if I tried to do all sixty of them, palate fatigue—you get palate fatigue. I they, it would just be too much, and even just following those tens. By the time I'm done, it's like I've had enough. All right now, that makes it challenging for whiskeys. Because whiskeys obviously has minimally more than twice the amount of alcohol as your average wine, even your high end uh, high high ABV wines, right? And then you're talking peated, right? Which really saturates the palate, which I'm doing tonight. We're we're, we're doing uh, peated whiskeys, uh, which is why I'm only doing two. Okay, Scott and Bart will do long lines up, a lot of lineups, right? More power to them. I don't think. I could do that and uh, remain. I have to maintain some accuracy, maintain some accuracy. What happens is when you're doing a long lineup of wines, one long lineup of whiskeys, say it's at a wine festival or something like that. And you're a judge, a panel doing you know, a big long lineup of Zinvendels on Lodi. The ones with the higher ABV and more punch when you get fatigue will grab your attention. Those are the ones you're going to notice, and consequently, so they don't get lost in the ocean of wines you've been tasting, and so consequently, they get noticed. Consequently, they get higher scores. And this is why people tend to fault Robert Parker for lacking higher ABV wines, which is then has affected the market because he gives them high scores, which then um, people start changing the how they make wines in order to suit his palate. It's called the Parkerization of wine. Um, there's videos on it. Articles on support. So, in a similar fashion, I, me personally, going head to head, me personally, this is, I'm just talking about me. I would keep try to keep down to two, three at the most. Of course, drink a lot of water. Alrighty, so uh, we're into it a half hour. I've been going blah 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 blah. Let's get into the whiskeys. I've already poured these. They've been sitting in here now for an hour. Got the Scotch Test Dummies coins on here. I have mixed them up a bunch of times before going live. I swirled them around, you know, afterwards. So now let's get into the whiskeys. I have um, a, like a little sticky note on the bottom with the initials. One says BR and the other one says GD uh, for Glandronic and uh, Ben, ben Riek. I So I don't know which one's which. We'll give the reveal at the end and I'll, I'll tell you which one I think I prefer. <clears throat> All right, let's get into this. Well, this is my first time using these glasses. It's a little weird. Wow. So 
I don't know what it's interesting. It's amazing how much the visual, psychologically, I think, the visual affects your other senses. So I've done blind tasting stuff with wines where you put on a blindfold and they'll give you a white wine and a red wine. Can you tell a red wine from a white wine if you're doing it blind? The, the key is pay attention to tannins. Forget all the fruits and flowers and aromas and spice. Pay attention to tannins on average. Most white wines don't have any tannin or very little. Red wines are going to have tannin. So if you want to identify a white from a red, go with the tannins. Wow. Interesting. Thus far on my right, I mean, just the first sniff, I like the one on the right more. They're both very nice. I'm getting, so I'm getting a, something a little bit more iodine, a little bit more medicinal. At first, I, I thought it was a little green, but I think it's just a little bit more oceanic. Yeah, there's a moderate amount of smoke in there and peat in there. A little bit more. So I do this. To, don't swirl. I see whiskey tubers doing this. Swirl this. Don't freaking swirl. What you're going to do is you're going to exaggerate the alcohol. Don't do that. This is your nosing space. So you only pour the whiskey to here. This is a space. This is like the air space in a, in a carburetor. You're you're smelling a combination of air and uh, and, and aromas are coming off the whiskey. You don't want it to be full of just nothing but alcohol, right? Because that's what you get, nothing but alcohol. So instead, I'm coating the side of the glass. I'm coating the side of the glass by turning at a slight angle and then turning it. A little bit of spice. It's hard for me to talk and smell at the same time. More oceanic. Now, right now, I'm describing mostly the peaty character. Some lighter vanillas. Hint of chocolate. It's sharper. It's funny because I don't remember. It's more an acute, sharper aroma. The one on my right. This is a lot more earthy. A lot more chocolate, which I like. A little saltiness, but no oceanic. Luna asks, how about a Blanc Noir from uh, a Barrique? Would there be tannins? Honest question. A Blanc Noir? Well, Noir means black and Blanc means white. So I don't know what you're talking about. From a barrique, a blanc noir. Blanc means so a white black. I don't know what you're talking about. And the foggiest idea what you're talking about. Sorry. You mean Pinot Noir? A blanc a white from a black? I don't sorry. Uh, I'll Google it later. I'm sorry, I don't know what you're talking about. Joey Short Pants is asking about the Deanston 12. What's your opinion? I like Deanston. Been to the distillery. I like the whiskeys. Uh, Deanston 12 is a solid dram. Don't currently have a bottle. I've seen a lot of my whiskeys from my travels, and they're not, a lot of them are not off the shelf bottles. So, right now, the one on the right, I'm liking a little bit more. It's earthier, it's chocolate. I'm almost tobacco, caramels, fudge. A lesser, let lesser, less spice. Blanc de Noir. Oh, okay. Blanc de Noir. So a white from a black. Okay. Uh, pure, okay. A Blanc de Noir is a, um, a white from a black. So that's a white wine. White, a white wine. A white wine. A white wine from a black grape. There you go. Okay. That's something different. Uh, there are a lot of things that could be Blanc de Noir. It's not a particular. You can make a white wine from a Pinot Noir and call it a Blanc Noir. 
because it's a red grape. All you have to do is not have any skin contact and you can make a white wine. It would come across similar to as a, a Pinot Blanc or as a Chardonnay. Are there white Pinot grapes? Yes. So the Pinot, I'm, I'm talking about wine. The Pinot is an entire family of grapes. The Pinot gene, uh, is a, Pinot is a very highly mutative grapes. It changes a lot. So you have uh, Pinot Noir, you have Pinot Meunier, uh, you have Pinot Blanc, you have uh, Pinot Grigio, you have a, a whole a lot of other Pinots. You even have a hybrid called Pinotage, which is Cincel and the Pinot Noir grape. I have seen a vine in which there were red and white grapes on the same vine because the Pinot Noir um, vine, it mutated and it was given white grapes, right? I've had a uh, Blanc de Noir, I've had a Blanc de Noir from Burgundy that came from a Pinot Noir vine, a very small bottling, um, because it was um, uh, it was a Pinot Noir, but it came from a mutated vine. So that's it. But I don't, I'm not going to, we're going to get back to whiskey. So this is more oceanic. This is a little bit more briny. This is a little bit more slight, slightly more, more, more medicinal. Interesting. This is a lot more chocolatey. This is more earthy. So thus far on the nose, on the nose, I'm going with the one on the right. But, but. With me just saying that, the problem with doing that is I've now prejudiced myself, right? I've got to plant it into my head, and that could cause me to come up with perceptions throughout the rest of the tasting. So you actually don't want to do what I just did. You want to make your notes as what you're getting and hold any valuation until you're finished. So I actually just did something you're not supposed to do. Because once you get that thought in your head, I think this is what this is. You have jumped ahead. And now you may actually start tasting things that aren't there or making an evaluation based on that. But this is a live stream. I got to have something to talk about, right? So let's move on. All right. Start with the one on the left. Oh, you know what I forgot to do? Oh, I forgot to do something. Hold on. I goofed. So I did a little goof. I meant to do this. Uh, here we go. All right. Sorry. Should have done this earlier. So the, this side-by-side -side look at the whiskeys. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the Glendronic Peated Highland Single Malt Scotch Whiskey, 100% malted barley, ex bourbon, ex Oloroso sherry, and ex PX uh, Pedro Jimenez cast, non chill filtered, question mark, natural color. It's a non age statement, so it's got to be at least three years. 46% alcohol by volume and sells for about $65. The Ben Riek, also, which is a single malt, it's 100 uh, malt barley, ex bourbon, ex Oloroso, so it doesn't have the uh, Pedro Jimenez cast. Also, is it unchivalred? Does it have add color? Don't know. Minimum 10 years, 46%. So this is a good head-to-head. -head. When you're doing head-to-heads, I think you want to have whiskeys that are very close. You don't want to do, you know, a scotch up against a bourbon unless you're just what's your personal preference of one over the other. You want to do whiskeys that are close. So when I was doing, say, a Highland versus an Isla, I was choosing bottles that I thought would be a good match. Look at the 46% ABV, also price range, because that varies according to where you live. So this is a really good head-to-head. -head. One of them has PX, the other one does not. One has an age statement, the other one does not. So the Glendronic potentially is younger. Um, and there you go. All right, I meant to do that earlier, but it's all right. All right, so that's what I'm doing side by side. Now, if I was doing this really, really blind, I now know or reminded myself based on those notes, one of these has PX and the other one does not. That could tell me if I can pick up now, if I can pick up, if I think I can detect Pedro Jimenez, bingo, that'll, I got a bug flying by me. That'll tell me which one's which, right? If I get something that I think is a hint towards Pedro Jimenez, then I know what it is, right? So if you really want to do it blind, I would not have shown that slide. I would have not have reviewed those notes. The whiskeys would have been put down, and I wouldn't have been told what's in them, right? All right. So that 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 so that's a thing. That's a thing. That's a thing. All right. Let's move on. 
Now the question is, can Eric detect which ones has the Pedro Jimenez? All right, on the pallet, bugs always land in pigs cast whiskey. Yeah, I, they probably they might have a preference for it. Um, interesting because I'm in California, we don't have a big bug problem here. I don't have any creeks or swamps or anything. Hmm. Mm -mm -mm. One of my left is sweet, and this is dry. <clears throat> I prefer. Start sweet, transition into dry. That's the way I like it. I like it when a whiskey, again, this is personal preferences, because it gives you variation. I don't like the same thing necessary through all the way through. I like it to finish it dry. I like it when it can have either like a nutty character. I like it when it can have, um, which happened a lot with sherry cast because there's an oxidative quality to sherry cast. Um, and I like the, the I like the evolution. Hmm. Hmm. I like it a lot. Martin um, Caravati asks, "Love to hear your thoughts on adding water to whiskey. Never drop by drop. Good splash. I need to get. I had some. I don't have any. I had. They were like um, pipettes, and they're plastic." And you could pinch, you could put it into water, pinch it, and then drop it like that. I don't have any. I need to get a new one. Uh, you can also, sometimes I use a straw like this. A teaspoon, I, I tend to do a teaspoon at a time, a teaspoon at a time. Unless I'm doing balconas, you could practically just drown a freaking balconas because they're at 65.2% alcohol by volume or something like that. And it just takes, it'll, it'll take the water. So the balconas, I had this last night. Um, if you guys didn't watch the, the Rotgut review, Whiskey Review, Rotgut, I was on there, Bart from Sky System was on there, Bill Whiskey Dictionary was on there, uh, Matt Zittrick from um, the Whiskey Crusaders was on there, and then later on, Scott came on from Sky System, and of course, Ed was on there. I sort of did a corking of or whatever the Balcona is, peated, and it's like 65.2. Now, man, you could... Drown it. Those whiskeys, you want to put water in it, put a cover on it, and come back to it four hours later so that the water and the whiskey marry really well. That's how, with Balcona's, that high end, and, you know, alcohol, that's how I do those. In fact, I left one actually overnight and I tasted it this morning um, to really let it marry overnight with a coin on top. All right, let's get back in these whiskeys. Drink a little bit of water. All right. In the mid palette, there is a whiny note. It, it's like a blackberry, blueberry wine note. Um, it's kind of sweet. I'm not getting the medicinal iodine notes on the palette. I am getting a little bit of like a black licorice sort of on the back end. Has a decent evolution. It does finish slightly dry. I don't know if you, my brother is watching television upstairs and it's, I can hear it really loud. I wish he would turn it down. All right, next one. Um. Mm. Oh. Mm, mm, that's delicious. All right. Not as sweet. This one's not as sweet as this one, but it doesn't sweetness. It's richer. Dark chocolate. Dark caramels, vanilla, a little bit of a nuttiness, more saltiness. No oceanic character to it. Nougat and caramels and vanilla, loads of vanilla. It does stay mostly sweet all the way through, but it's really, really, really rich. Really, really, really rich. This one's more whiny. 
my, my whole characteristic of wine, this one's richer. Um, I kind of wish I review, reviewed my notes on these two whiskeys so I could tell them apart. Mm. I my personal preference is for this one. Whatever this is, this is my personal preference. I suspect, and I could be wrong, I could be making my total fool out of myself. I suspect this one is the PX, has has the PX. Hmm. All right, so we're at 10 till. Let's see, I'm gonna go back to the notes real quick. All right. The Glendronic has the PX cask. The Ben Rick just has the Oloroso and the X bourbon. Hmm. I am a little scared to say which one's which. So I'm going to say this. But I'm going to do it. Could be making an ass out of myself. This one, I prefer this one. I prefer this one. I suspect this is the one that has a little bit of PX in it. A little bit of PX in it. So if it is, this will have GD on the bottom, and this will have BR in the bottom. Let's see how it goes. Drum roll. You know what I could have done? I didn't think I just I could have cheated. While I had that up, while I had that slide up that you couldn't see me, I could have looked at the bottom, but I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. I just thought about, wow, I could have cheated right there, but I didn't. That would be an that would be an a-hole move. All right. So I'm thinking this one's a Glendronic, and I'm thinking this is Ben Rick, but I could be wrong. Let's see it go. Yep, Glendronic. Um I'm just, I'm I don't want to spill it. Can you can you see that? There's a G. It's on pink paper, and it's a GD. Uh, I don't know if you can see that or not. Anyway, Glendronic, the GD. See, but if I was going to cheat you, I wouldn't tell you that I could have cheated you. I'd have just been trying to be sly. Uh, and the BR. I don't know if you can. I don't know if you can see that or not. If you can see that, BR. So I got it right. So I got them right. Um, the BR, the Ben Romick. All right. You never know how well the camera. I, I rewatched the videos. You can never. It's hard to tell um, the camera. So between the two, my personal uh, favorite turned out to be the Ben Rick over the Glendronic, but they're both great whiskeys. They're both great whiskeys. Don't get me wrong. Um, the distinguishing note between the two that I could tell them apart was because of the um, Pedro Jimenez. Peter Jimenez, it's a classic character. You get this in the Glen Mori, Peter Jimenez Peated. You get it in uh, Ardbeg and O. It's a black blueberry. Now, you may prefer that note, and that's what you like, and you like that, right? All right. So, and, and that's what you like, and you prefer that. Again, we're talking a great whiskey going up against another great whiskey, right? It's like comparing great guitarists or great singers. Right, um, who's better, Placido Domingo or Luciano Pavarotti? Right, I mean, <laughs> how do you do? That? I'm more of a Pavarotti fan. My, I think one of my brothers likes opera. He's more of a, uh, a Placido Domingo fan. Right, I'm more of a, I'm more of a, you know, Pavarotti fan. All right. So what I my takeaway from this is not necessarily just which one's better than the other one, which I prefer. I found it interesting was that. I was able to identify and recognize the Pedro Jimenez cask. Um, and that was the one that really let me know what the heck it was, what the heck it was. Yeah, so I listened. Hey, Michael Gonzalez, thanks for tuning in. I listened to all styles. Of, if you were to look at my music list on my phone, jazz, classical, opera, rock. I don't listen to a lot of country. I like Johnny Cash. Some, some of the really, really old country people, Marty Robbins. Um, if I'm in R&B, gospel. I'm very, very eclectic in my wines, very eclectic in my, whis my, my uh, whiskeys, very eclectic in my music. I'm more of a science fiction, you know, action movies. But one of my favorite movies is uh, It's a Wonderful Life. Um, so I, I don't, I'm not into big love stories or 
mystery who did it murder movies i do not watch horror movies no horror movies no horror movies and, I, and the only music i don't listen to is like rap i think i don't listen to it. other than that very eclectic same thing with all right so i'm happy that i was able to identify the pedro Jimenez cast shows me you know what i've been studying is uh sticking in there and that's but still uh the ben rick comes off as my favorite um and apparently they have new bottling new labeling I think it's the same whiskey, but the label has changed. They may have dropped the name Curiositas, if I recall correctly. And they may have even bumped it up to a 12-year-old. So keep looking on. Sam Clark says, right with you there, Eric. That's the only uh, good core range um, that I've not had. Um, mm, 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 mm. So still, really, really great whiskeys. All righty. So... Um, it is challenging to get to the post office these days. Um, not because of snow, but because of COVID and time. I'm just ex extremely busy. Uh, there's someone I have wrapped a challenge coin for them. It's wrapped. It's ready to go. I just need to get to the damn post office. Also, it's just a matter of mindful. And I'm juggling so many different things, putting out so much content, working so many long hours. That being said, um, if you want one of my challenge coins, um, should have should have had it sitting here already. If you want one, um, da -da 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 -da. where can I find the banner thing I'm supposed to be putting up here? Uh, banners. There we go. There we go. Um, there we go. Alrighty. If you want a challenge coin, if you want a challenge coin, uh, the, the, these are huge. These will actually fit over the larger Glen Cairns. This is really, really heavy. It's me it's it's metal. It's thick. It has me on the front and the whiskey ambassador on the on the back. Um, I had I think three hundred of these made. They're not numbered. Once these are gone, I will come up with a new version. Uh, uh, it'll be the next stage. Probably the next series will probably be very very similar. Um, but I'll, I'll probably do. Uh, maybe a gold that'll be black silver and gold something a little more a little more in depth there but if you want one uh, send twenty dollars to uh, via paypal to eric Waite at yahoo.com also send me an email for whatever reason paypal paypal does not send me a notification you've got mail they don't tell me that so if i forget i need to go back i need to go up and check it and if you haven't already if you're interested in supporting what i'm doing here uh feel free to become a um uh patreon all righty so hey uh donna pass says i have the old gold finger eric yeah that was the old, i still have about four or five of those left uh that was the pre-beard days those are cool uh and they're not as big uh but that's sort of the old classic all righty so hey um uh sam clark says sorry to go back to wine but have you been able to get much all sauce in your time it's been a while all sauce for those who know is a region that, uh sort of it's the driest region in france Borders Germany and France, um, separated by the Vosges Mountains, and they do French grapes in a German fashion. Best way to describe it. Fantastic wines, fantastic wines. Yeah, I love Alsace. Uh, great, fantastic wines, great wines. So, but we're gonna wreck it up. Yes, yes, I'm smart. Thank you very much. Also, remind send your email. I've had two people order a coin and they didn't give me an address. I don't have any psychic powers, I don't know where you live. Uh, <laughs> so include your address. Otherwise, I'm going to have a challenge getting it to you. So, all righty. Adam T., thank you much for, for tuning in. All right, so I hope you all have a fantastic weekend. Uh, if you prefer one of these whiskeys, if you've had them both and you prefer one over the other, don't be offended, you know, by what my evaluation, my take on it. This is my part. This is my personal preference of which one I prefer. Um, but it was a lot of fun. Uh, I think Kenya, is, for me, it turned into... Can identify the PX, and I think I scored on that one. That that was for me that's the biggest takeaway. But again, both of them absolutely fantastic whiskeys. And uh, let's go out here with a little bit of uh, rock and roll again. Uh, thank you for uh, tuning in. Thank you for your support. If you haven't already, give this video a thumbs up. If you're watching on the replay, if you have any comments, if you have any questions, leave them down below. And uh, slanjiva.